Have you ever dreamed of traveling in time? We'll make it happen. We've always been fascinated by this idea. If you ever had the option, would you, where would you go? Or rather, when would you go in time? So let me ask this question to Amir. If you had the option to travel in time, would you go to the past or to the future? Interesting question. I'm a computer professor interested in mobiles, gadgets, future innovations. So predicting my answer is very easy. I'm definitely interested to go to the past. <laughs> to be more specific, between the years 700 and 1400, this region was the hub of innovation. We invented the camera, medical instruments, theories of chemistry, foundations of algebra, even coffee. Our addiction was discovered in this region at that time. So I would love to go back, definitely, to these good old days, participate in innovation, make a difference, and witness the glories of innovation in this region. So these were the good old days. But I'm afraid the picture is totally different today. So let me take you back to the present and show you how the world map really looks like today. But are you sure you want to come back to the present? Because the picture you are about to see is very scary. So for those of you with high blood pressure or heart problems, <laughs> maybe you can close your eyes right now, because what you are about to see is a bit annoying. Back to 2017. And this is the world map today. Distorted, isn't it? This is the world map today. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> so, the different regions on this map... Show the sizes of the different world regions based on their contributions to research and development. Oh! <laughs> See the effect of time travel? <laughs> Things are playing back. <laughs> How did it happen? <laughs> no one knows! <laughs> so how did it happen with us? <laughs> Alright. So, maybe I have a chance to explain. <laughs> so, <laughs> as you can see, the different regions of the world have been resized here to show their contributions to research and development. And can you spot our regions here? They have shrunk to the point that we cannot even pin our location on this map. And how did this happen? People say that we lost the proper ecosystem for innovation. And I personally think that in the process, we've lost something really important, the spirit and belief that we can change our status quo. We have internalized, and I'm sure many of us agree today, that we have become consumers more than producers of innovation. But who's responsible for that? And who's responsible to restore the map back? Do we have to wait for the perfect moment to start innovation again? In my humble op opinion, we are all responsible to restore the map. As a matter of fact, a group like you is a perfect example of people who want to restore the map. So we don't have to wait for the perfect moment, as a matter of fact. The perfect moment. 21st of August, 2017, a perfect moment of total solar eclipse happened over the United States and I happened to be there at the time. The moment of totality is emotionally overwhelming. It is spectacular, but you go through different emotional changes as you watch the scene. The world goes dark, and for two whole minutes that, that feels really long, you start to get this feeling that the darkness is never going to end. But eventually, of course, the sun reappears and you start getting this boost of hope and you realize that the fear and doubt are always in our minds. While people were enjoying these two minutes, I was also interested in these interesting glasses they used to witness the eclipse. Being a technology person looking for gadgets all the time, I wanted to see who invented this. Do you know who invented these glasses? Who came up with the theories? that led to this amazing two minutes. He is a fam famous Ibn al-Haytham, one of our stars of our golden age of innovation. What is even more inspiring is his story. 
Ibn al Haytham was imprisoned in Egypt for years. While being locked in a dark cell, he was inspired by a beam of light to come up with the idea of the camera. He didn't wait for the perfect moment. He didn't wait for the ecosystem to support him. He took one beam of light and he contributed to humanity. So that people later, right now, you cannot live without your camera. Just to take a picture and send it to your friends on Instagram or to document whatever you are doing. He contributed to humanity from a dark cell. He allowed people later to enjoy two spectacular minutes of their lives. So inspired by Ibn al-Haytham and many other stories in our heritage, we decided to, to dig more into our heritage and look for the, that old cartographer's toolbox that has the tools our ancestors used to draw this amazing map of innovation. And here is what we found. The first tool, multidisciplinary thinking. We are using this word a lot these days in different settings, business and educational settings. It is very effective in bringing out more ideas from different dis disciplines or coming up with new solutions. But actually, the concept is not new. Do you identify the scientist? Let me give you a hint. I put his picture in my first class of algorithms. And I see some faces here that I attended this class, actually. So, if you can relate to this guy, in the days of this guy, he's the founder of theories of algebra. In the days of, his, of this guy, theories of algebra were being translated from Arabic to Latin and English. He is Al-Khawarizmi, Al the father of algorithms. Since I'm a computer science professor, I definitely consider him one of the fathers of computer science. Was he only a mathematician? No. He was an expert in geography, astronomy, cartography, philosophy, among others. So he believed in multi the power of multidisciplinary thinking. Inspired by uh, geniuses like this guy, we believe as well in the power of multidisciplinary research and activities. So we started to organize community events that would elaborate on the idea of multidisciplinary interaction, allowing the community to come, act, and think in a multidisciplinary way. Perhaps the most remarkable one of all is a hackathon that we organized last year. A hackathon, for those of you who don't know, is a programming marathon. So people meet for a certain amount of time, in our case it was two days, they write computer programs for a particular cause. The cause here was helping Kuwait marine science problems, trying to solve some problems. So in collaboration with many organizations here in Kuwait, we organized this event. If you look at the teams here on the tables, each table had a group of people that, compo that consists of one marine uh, scientist, one programmer at least, one business analyst, and one graphic designer. So we provided the venue for people to experience the power of multidisciplinary interaction. The result after two days was amazing. We had seven working projects. Each one of them can contribute to solving Kuwait problems. Was the picture as colorful as it seems? No. We faced a lot of problems. Logistics, bureaucracy, support. But even more, more uh, challenge was energy drainers. You know these guys when they tell you you can never do this because simply they can't do it themselves. So if you have these people in any field, just lock them away. You need to be as positive as possible. And finally, we had the quitters. We have these people everywhere. People who sign for an event or show up and then disappear on you. As a matter of fact, many stories happen like this. So I. After the, the, the opening night, I caught some guy just escaping from the hole because he said, I'm not up to the challenge. So you have to be patient. You have to try to convince these people to rejoin. Maybe it works out. Maybe you didn't believe enough yourself, in yourself. The result was a picture of one happy family after two days. Great memories and great achievements. 
And what is even more inspiring, that some of the people who didn't believe in themselves ended up in the winning teams when they continued. Any more interesting details about this photo, other than some, some faces are here already today? All right. Can you see how many females, fa female faces on this photo? This might not be unusual for us, but if this photo is shared to other parts of the world, it will make news. You know why? Because one of the challenges to innovation today, worldwide, is the low number of female participation. Figures show that in the United States, females enrolled in the fields of computer science and information system account for only 18%. And the number is even lower in the UK. But you know what? In our region, the numbers are way higher than the, than the international average. They account for, for 40 to 50 percent. Something really amazing and definitely something to capitalize on. You know, this is also not new to us. This is deeply rooted in our heritage and along our timeline, you could see many, many female innovators and pioneers in their own fields. So nothing new. That takes me to 2010. I was mentoring a team of three Kuwaiti ladies in an innovation competition. The competition had three different legs. They had to win, to win in Kuwait to qualify to the regional uh, competition that was in Dubai. And then if they make it in Dubai, they qualify to the world finals in Poland. The three ladies were amazing. They won the Kuwait title and they qualified to the Dubai competition. First surprise and challenge. One of the team members came to my office and she says, Professor, I am pregnant and I'm due to deliver my baby in the time of the competition. So I will not be able to go to Dubai. So I'll have to go short. So we went one team member short, taking all the challenges and so on. The two ladies worked really hard. But you know what? In Dubai, they really made it and they won the regional title. Not only this, while telling Abrar, the, the mother at the time on the phone, that we won, I was live with her, updating her. From excitement, she was about to deliver <laughs> on the phone. So I was like, uh, just wait, just wait a minute till we finish. And then the competition ended, we won. A week later, Abrar delivered. And then she joined us to go to the World Finals, actually. She had two babies, but she left them. Well, the father, and she joined it. When we, when we went to Poland, the finals were there, the team was very well received. I mean, Kuwaiti innovative women, media coverage, and people, uh, even other teams were celebrating the team, and I thought, again, uh, are you sure you are talking about us? Is there a mistake here or something? But when I got to know that the competition had 68 teams and only two of them were totally formed of females, of which one of, the, one of them is us, I, and I started to understand what is going on. This really was remarkable. So allow me to put the picture of the three ladies here on the same timeline of people who <laughs> contributed. Because these three ladies, these three ladies, Aisha, Maria, Mariam, and Abrar really made a difference and put a sign on this innovation line. What is even more interesting is after that point of time, Rahab and myself got inspired to start research about women in computing. So this was an outcome of this experience. This endless loop of inspiration that I always show in my first day of classes. Someone would inspire you and you would inspire another person. It's a ripple effect. It's an endless loop. So you get inspired and you inspire others, whether this in a classroom, in a business setting, in a government organization, wherever you are, this endless loop of inspiration is what might lead to restoring the innovation map. So, we've got to do all what it takes to keep this loop going. Each one of us has a responsibility in his own area and in his own domain. 
to find inspiration, travel across the earth, or travel through time, but never settle down and think that we are incapable of changing our status quo. What started in the year 2009 as an adventure by a group of students coming to my office saying, we'd like you to mentor us in a competition, ended up in a ripple effect of success stories. Year after year, this is my 10th year here. So year after year, we had success stories in different uh, uh, competitions and innovation contests. Innovation is contagious, I would say. This is what I call the ripple effect of innovation. You start with an inspiring idea, a group of risk takers would show up and help you to make it reality. Once they start making some success, other inspired people would join. After the inspired people join, the noise would start getting louder. What will happen after that, the community will feel for you. So after we started making success year after year, we started getting funding for our projects. We started getting support from different organizations for our projects. And eventually, this should, should lead to restoring the innovation. Once upon a time, back in history, a group of multidisciplinary thinkers came together in what they called the House of Wisdom. They sat together exchanging their ideas, showing their innovations, and spreading their knowledge to the world through translation and documentation. Today, 16th of September 2017, here in this room, we have a group of multi-thinker, multidisciplinary thinkers doing exactly the same like their ancestors did, on the same sands of Arabia, speaking the language of knowledge, sharing ideas that are worth spreading, and initiating sparks of hope and innovation. Thank you.